In the last lecture, we talked about how some molecules can just diffuse through the phospholipid bilayer. Um, these are going to be lipid soluble molecules, but if they are um, water soluble, if they're if they have a charge, meaning they're an ion, or if they're polar covalent, um, which means just like water is a polar covalent molecule, um, that means that they're going to be water soluble. So water soluble or, or if they have a charge, they are not going to be able to move through the phospholipid bilayer like lipid soluble molecules can. They're going to have to move by facilitated diffusion or else they're going to have to diffuse through a channel protein, but they will have to move through a membrane protein. Now facilitated diffusion is a special type of diffusion which still moves molecules from their high concentration to their low concentration, but they have to move by a carrier protein. Okay, so facilitated diffusion fusion uses carrier proteins to move large molecules down their concentration gradient, and that means from high to low concentration. Um, what happens is that the compound that's being moved binds to the receptor site on the carrier protein, causes the protein to change shape, and then the compound moves across the membrane, either into the cell or out of the cell. Good examples of substances that move by facilitated diffusion through a carrier protein are glucose and amino acids. This is how they're transported into the cell or out of the cell. Now, <clears throat> the amount of carriers is going to um, determine how much glucose or amino acids are moved across because the only, if there's only six carriers, only six molecules of glucose can be moved across at the time. You know, it's all depended, dependent on the number of carriers. But this is what it looks like. Here's your carrier protein, the blue molecule. Here's your glucose molecule. And you can see that the concentration is high in the extracellular fluid and low inside the cell, in the cytoplasm. So the carrier protein um, uses the, it still moves the glucose down its concentration gradient, but the glucose has to bind to the receptor site, and then it causes the carrier to change shape and move the glucose in. So this is facilitated diffusion. If it was regular diffusion, then, then the substance would just move through this phospholipid bilayer, through these phospholipids. It's still a passive process though. So let's talk about active transport. This time energy is required in the form of ATP. And active transport moves substances against their concentration gradient from where their concentration is low to where it is high. Um, there are some examples. There's the ion pump that transports um, ions across plasma membranes like sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and chloride ions, probably the most common ones. Then there are exchange pumps, and our um, most well-known example is the sodium-potassium exchange pump. And the sodium-potassium exchange pump is a counter-transport exchange pump. It pumps sodium out and potassium into the cell and it pumps them against their concentration gradient. So let's look at it. Here's our sodium potassium pump right here in blue. And what it's going to do is you can see that the concentration of sodium is high outside in the extracellular fluid and it is low in the cytoplasm, but the sodium potassium exchange pump is still pumping sodium out against its concentration gradient. So three sodium ions are pumped out for every two potassium ions that are pumped into the cell. That's how the sodium potassium exchange pump works. And we're gonna get into this um, and talk about the importance of it a little bit later, but it's very, very important for maintaining a certain voltage or uh, potential across the plasma membrane. It's very important for keeping the, the plasma membranes of muscle cells and nerve cells at a voltage of negative 70 millivolts. And these voltages need to be maintained. These, they're called membrane potentials and they need to be maintained because otherwise you can't get a muscle to contract, you can't get a nerve to, send in, to conduct an impulse and we would die. 
So it's that important. The sodium potassium exchange pump, which is found in the plasma membranes of most cells, but especially muscle and nerve cells, helps to maintain this membrane potential of negative 70. Okay? And we'll talk about more detail about that in another chapter. Vesicular transport is bulk transport. That's another, it moves a large amount of material or bulk amount of material. B-U-L-K, bulk. Okay, so vesicular transport is either endos endocytosis or exocytosis. Endocytosis is when a large amount of material is moved by a vesicle, that's why it's called vesicular transport, into the cell. That's the key is that it's a large amount of material moved into the cell. There are three types and all endocytosis and exocytosis requires energy. Um, so if it is called pinocytosis, number two, pinocytosis, another word for that is cell drinking. So this is when the cell brings in a solution if it's called phagocytosis, that's cell eating. So that's when the cell brings in a, um, some solid material, okay? But then there's receptor-mediated endocytosis, and that is when material is brought into the cell bound to receptors. So it's a specific material that's coming into the cell. Here's an example of receptor-mediated endocytosis. Cholesterol the what we call the bad cholesterol the ldls comes into cells this way and iron iron ions which are written like this fe with either a two plus or a three plus charge um so this is what receptor-mediated endocytosis looks like. You have basically these um, ligands are, are the chemicals, either the cholesterol or the iron ions, bind to receptors on the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane kind of forms this indention that, that pulls these molecules into the cell, bound to their receptors, and then that indention actually pinches off and forms a vesicle. And then to break down whatever that substance is, the vesicle will fuse with a lysosome. The lysosome will release its enzymes into that vesicle and break down the, the material. So this is just an example of um, receptor-mediated endocytosis. Pinocytosis is cell drinking because that's when um, the cell is bringing, the plasma membrane is, is forming a pocket called a vesicle, around a solution rather than a solid. And then you have phagocytosis or cell eating. Here is an example of a white blood cell of our immune system being engulfed or engulfing a bacterial cell. And this is an example of phagocytosis. And notice how a lysosome is fusing with the vesicle that contains the bacterium, and it's breaking down the bacterium and killing it. And exocytosis is when material is released into the, the extracellular environment, so um, through a vesicle. So here's your phagocytosis is when the cell takes in the bacterium, breaks it down, but now that broken down bacterial cell and all those broken down lysosomal enzymes are in this vesicle and they're waste. So this vesicle will now fuse with the plasma membrane and all of those contents will be released out of the cell. That's exocytosis. Contents are discharged to the extracellular environment. A lot of times we call this secretion. This is a good table to help you um, to organize the types of transport. The passive transport processes are diffusion, osmosis, and facilitated diffusion. And the active transport processes start right here. Active transport and vesicular transport. And you can read, uh, this is a good table to go back to and read. Table 3.2 um, to kind of explain, I would say, um, this is probably substances involved.
most of the questions I've seen in the quiz are going to ask you what type of substances move by this method. So um, small ions can diffuse. Most gases and lipid soluble materials can diffuse across the um, plasma membrane. If they're ions, they're going to need a channel protein because ions are charged, and that means they're soluble in water. But if they're gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide, or if they're lipid soluble, then they can just diffuse directly through the phospholipid bilayer. Osmosis is always just the transport of water. And remember, water follows solute. It's going to move to the high solute concentration. Glucose and amino acids are transported across the plasma membrane by facilitated diffusion. An active transport, the example that we looked at was the sodium-potassium pump, although other ions can be transported by active transport. All right, checkpoint questions. What is the difference between active and passive? Active transport moves substances against their concentration gradient from low to high and uses ATP whereas passive does not use ATP and moves substances down their concentration gradient from high to low. So passive is from high to low, whereas active is the other way. Active is from low to high. Number 12, during digestion, the concentration of hydrogen ions in the stomach rises to many times that within the cells lining the stomach. And just to remind you, that means that the pH is going to be dropping low. So a high hydrogen ion concentration means a low pH. Is the type of transport process involved passive or active? I would say it's active because if you're increasing the concentration more and more and more, there's a certain point where instead of moving from high to low, it's, it's now going to be moving to high, but it's still, they, it still keeps moving. Um, yeah, whenever concentrations rise many, many, many times, you know, um, keep rising higher and higher and higher, most of the time that's active transport. When certain types of white blood cells encounter bacteria, they are able to engulf them and bring them into the cell. Specifically, this process is called phagocytosis, which is a type of endocytosis. Let's go back to that. Phagocytosis, which is a type of endocytosis. Okay. All right, the cytoplasm of the cell, this is just some information. Um, the cytoplasm is a general term for between the plasma membrane and the nucleus. The cytosol is the fluid inside the cell, and then the organelles are also found within the cytoplasm. <clears throat> the cytosol contains dissolved nutrients like glucose and amino acids. It contains ions like sodium and potassium and chloride, proteins and waste products. Organelles are internal structures that perform specific functions in the cell. They can be ribosomes, which are not membranous. They don't have a membrane around them. Or they can be membranous organelles like the um, mitochondria, the Golgi complex. Now, here's some information on the cytoskeleton of the cell. The cytoskeletal fibers are microfilaments, which are the smallest ones intermediate filaments, which are medium size, and microtubules, which are the thickest. And this shows you some pictures. Here's a microtubule, which is very thick. There are microfilaments that you would see inside of a microvilli. These are, are smaller, and um, then there are intermediate filaments, These are the purple ones here. Microfilaments are the thinnest. They're usually composed of actin. Actin is found in muscle cells and helps for contraction. So they, they do participate in muscle contraction in muscle cells. They also attach the plasma membrane to the cytoplasm. That's important to know. Intermediate filaments strengthen and stabilize the cell and microtubules are the largest 
They give the